who thus also continues his family's symbolic lineage. In 2011-12, he spent a year in Berlin as a fellow of Wissenschaftskolleg, the institution to which the foundation of NEC is also connected. In his article for Vico's Wissenschaftskolleg, sorry, annual publication, Edem Edem warmly describes his Berlin experiences, his dialogues with those around him, Andre Plesho also being among them at one point. And let me quote from what Edem Edem wrote in that uh, yearbook. Throughout my stay, I was put in a situation of exposure to and conversation with an amazing variety of disciplines, approaches, methods, beliefs, attitudes, and characters with a density and intensity that is highly unlikely to ever occur again. I have listened, discussed, argued, shared, learned, missed, and failed to understand an overwhelming amount of information. <laughs> for this, and for all the fun that came with it, I have all my co-fellows to thank. That was a quote very appropriate for our neck. I like to think. <laughs> I know that André Plesho is tired of being thanked over and over again, as he told me with his characteristic modesty. But we will always be tireless in thanking him. More than 25 years ago, at Wissenschaft's Palette, he met Paul Flebenis, and they had the idea of founding NEC. On a different occasion, in the same place, he met the Demeldem, whom he invited to be part of our academic board. These are, so to speak, occurrences which, along a difficult but spectacular path, have all led to our encounter today. So, I give the floor to them and them, and thank you. Thank you, Valentina. You've uh, just proved that uh, all the scientific community is not about merit, but about networking. <laughs> so, thank you for that. And you've proved that my contribution to Ottoman history is based on nepotism. <laughs> so, you know, um, but I, I'll say something. I mean, um, I, I didn't expect these family connections to come up uh, for, the, for the reason that I, I try to avoid them because I always fear uh, the accusation of nepotism and whatever. Uh, but now that it's out of the bag, I would like to add one thing uh, to the illustrious career of my great-great-grandfather, and I wouldn't count his close collaboration with Abdul Hamid as one of the most prestigious things in his life, um, but he is a survivor of the Hios massacre. He's the Greek boy in Victor Hugo's uh, 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 poem. So it's a very strange career when you think of, uh, of uh, and it's very Ottoman in a sense, uh, so that's what I like uh, about him, but then again, uh, I insist on, well, trying at least to prove that whatever I do is based more on merit and curiosity than any uh, family uh, connection. Um, it's, oh, here he is. Um, because I'm going to talk about him. Sorry. No. Uh, because obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm so uh, pleased and so honored to be here for the 25th anniversary of or birthday of, uh, of NEC. Neck plus ultra. Everybody has done that, I suppose. Neck plus ultra, intelligent <laughs> <laughs> So, and, uh, and, and neck is, of course, not just neck, but it's also a great pleasure. It's, uh, it's an institution. Uh, I'm not going to say that it lives in the shadow of its founding father, but it lives with its founding father. And uh, therefore, happy birthday, Neck. Happy birthday, Andre. <laughs> Uh, so now, um, now that the um, the niceties are are done, I'm going to move on to this subject, and I have, of course, some explanations to give because I'm, as uh, Valentina said, I'm a 19th century person. I work on the second half of the 19th century. So what on earth do I have to do with the Alexander Romans? Uh, nothing. Nothing in the sense that I have no formation in uh, middle, uh, medieval uh, literature. I'm not a specialist of philology and Ottoman literature. Um, but, you know, accidents happen. Accidents happen, and especially, you know, when you come to a certain point in age and um, you come to a certain point in your career where 
you don't have to rush for a new promotion, and you know that your institution can't kick you out. Uh, you can do whatever you want. And that's the joys of history. I generally tell my students that, you know, what's nice about history is that it's a luxury. It can be a luxury. It can be something totally useless. And that, I think, is one explanation for my venturing into something that is absolutely not part of my formation and my specialty, which means that I won't be able to uh, expand and respond to certain aspects of, these, of this question. But it is an accident in the sense that I work on the 19th century and I work especially on uh, the history of archaeology. And this is how, again, something that is rather ambiguous because, again, when you do the history of archaeology without being an archaeologist, you come up with stuff that you don't even know whether it's important or not, significant or not, because you work on, I, I work a lot on the history of collections. Thank God for me, most of the collections, the early collections of the Imperial Museum, the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul, are misidentified. There's a lot of work to do on the basis of what I know, which is texts, documents. Um, there's a lot to do in order to replace, recontextualize much of the collections. And that's what I do because it's, you know, it's fun. It's like a detective story. You try to, and, and I was working on one particular object, which is uh, the little artifacts uh, you see here. Uh, if you want to dim the lights, uh, I don't need them, but it's, it's as you wish. I mean, it's a beautiful image from the 1890s that shows the state of the of the um, archaeological museum, the Imperial Museum, um, and you can see that it's everything but a museum. It's some kind of an assemblage of, of objects. But this uh, little statue, and I call it a little because it's not life size. It's slightly uh, smaller. Of Artemis, my mission in life, or one of my missions in life, was to prove that Artemis was not a lesbian. I will explain myself, because the thing is that this uh, statue um, in every catalogue was listed as coming from Lesbos, from the island of Mytilini, which made it a lesbian, and uh, here it is today. Um, it's one of the iconic uh, uh, objects of the um, Istanbul Archaeological Museum, and I came across documentation, uh, 19th century documentation, about its discovery that made me argue and prove, I hope, that uh, she was not from Lesbos, that she was from Smyrna, from Izmir, uh, the vicinity of Smyrna. And that's where um, this is the place she came from. It's what is called the Baths of Diana, uh, which is uh, in the vicinity of Istanbul. It's a pond. Uh, of uh, Izmir, sorry, uh, it's, a, it's a pond, and this is where it was uh, discovered. And when I uh, investigated Ottoman sources, because one of my uh, uh, obsessions is to try to document as much as possible the local dimension of these archaeological finds, try to not really uh, um, rewrite the history of archaeology because, I mean, the Ottoman sources are never going to give you the kind of information that you get from the white man and uh, his archaeology, his upper. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a male white man business uh, in the 19th century. But still, it's interesting to see that sometimes there is a local dimension that is interesting and gives you some kind of a context to uh, some of these objects and their discovery. And in this case, what I came across was an Ottoman text of the 17th century which related this place, the Pool of Diana, the Baths of Diana, with a certain Kaidefa. Kaidefa being some kind of a mythical character, and I'll talk about, it, uh, about her in, in just a while, which is also uh, connected, very strongly connected, to what you see on this image, which is the castle of Izmir which in Turkish is called Kadife Kale. Now, Kadife in Turkish means, um, what do you call it, a guru? Um, hmm? Oh, okay, it's the same. Okay, it's the same in the provinces. Okay, so, Kadife um, uh, Kale, so, uh, which makes you think that, you know, there's a, but it's not Kadife Kale, it's Kaidefa Kale, the castle of Kaidefa. And who is this Kaidefa? 
have some kind of a mythical uh, uh, character, which I found in a 17th century text by the famous uh, Ottoman traveler, Ibn al What makes him tra uh, famous is obviously that he's the only one uh, in the 17th century, so it's, it makes his fame kind of uh, um, uh, easy in that sense. And here's the text. Uh, the text is interesting because, you know, it gives you uh, an idea of how a 17th century uh, Ottoman uh, traveler, intellectual, is looking at some of the antiquities that he comes across. And he's talking about a gate into Katifekare, where he says there is in a niche, uh, there is a, um, a statue or a, a bust of a woman. When one comes from outside and needs to enter through this gate, at about two men's height, on the tower on the right side, there is, under an arch, an image of Mother Kaidefa, Kaidefa Anna in Turkish, uh, sculpted in marble. Wherever one goes, she seems to be looking in that direction. If one smiles, she does the same. If one starts to cry, it can be observed that she cries too. He must have tried it uh, uh, himself. It is a wondrous scene to behold. Nevertheless, she has no body beneath the neck, which is the definition of a bust. <laughs> uh, this is the radiant face of a goddess represented with a necklace around her neck, her rosy complexion, her head crowned with curls, and her eyes of a doe, uh, lined with coal. Uh, but she has no soul, which is the definition of a statue. <laughs> Interestingly, and that's very rare, uh, there is a coincidence of Ottoman and Western sources. In 1678, uh, Paul Ricot, who was a British uh, um, uh, diplomat, um, consul in, in Smyrna, also talks about this, but of course with a very Western position because he talks about the locals, the natives, and their beliefs. And here's what he said At the gate of the same fortress is a large head made of stone cemented to the wall. It resembles the head of an Amazon. He has references. Uh, and the Turks think. Uh, she is a certain Koidafa, about whom they tell the following story. Formerly, the archipelago, and what they call the archipelago is the Aegean Sea, was solid land, and Koidafa, who was then queen of that land, having refused passage through her domains to Alexander the Great, we're coming to him, who was on his way to conquer the East Indies, this prince decided to take revenge. To this aim, he cut the isthmus, we call the Hellespont, he's talking about the Dardanelles, um, and thus submerge these large expanses of land, which now form a vast sea. They add that of all these domains, there remains nothing except the tips of a few mountains, and that those are the islands of the archipelago, the Greek islands um, of the Aegean. So it's interesting to have this uh, simultaneous uh, um, uh, documentation of a tradition, of a legend, and this makes you think, obviously, that this must have been something that was very much repeated through oral and whatever means, not written necessarily. And uh, so much so that a traveller, an Ottoman traveller, and a British consul would have the same references and would uh, quote them. Now, a Vyanachedibi has more to say, but before that, let's go back to the history of collections, because the head is now in the Imperial Museum. It was brought to uh, uh, the Islamic Museum in uh, the um, 1870s, 1880s, we don't know exactly. But this is what it looks like in uh, Gustav Mendel's uh, catalogue of the Imperial Museum, et colossal, a colossal head. And this is a photograph, because I mean, these engravings were made from photographs. Now, obviously, the doe eyes and the uh, whatever, uh, um, uh, what's his name, the archie we saw in this, um, uh, in this head seem to have disappeared. Uh, but then again, here it is, this monumental ha uh, head. Um, so there is some kind of concrete evidence that links um, the archie and and uh, goes account to the present collections of the museum. But, if you look at Ehiyachidibi, you realize that it's not just about Kadifekale and about um, the Baths of uh, Diana called Halkapunar in Turkish. Uh, Kaidefa is all over the place. I've listed here on a map 
all the locations that are related in his account to Kaidefa. Kaidefa is either the founder of these places, your cousin and I, uh, met by Nietzsche's. I mean, you, you have all of them are somewhat related either to Kaidefa or to Kaidefa's daughter or to Kaidefa. There is a Anatolian myth of Kaidefa, which is some kind of a foundational myth of uh, all these uh, sites that we associate with um, antiquity and with, um, with um, contemporary Anatolia under Ottoman rule. And therefore, uh, also, um, what's his name, uh, Ivyachidivi's text is very interesting from the perspective of how he contextualizes uh, the story of Kaidefa in the grand narrative of history. Again, I don't like to have long texts, but this one is worth uh, being cited in detail because it's kind of foundational, at least for my presentation. So 5,075 years after the fall of Adam, uh, Alexander the Great became the world-conquering emperor of um, the surface of the earth, and all the kings submitted and pledged allegiance to him. Yet Kaidela, Greek queen of Macedonia and Smyrna, did not yield and became his strong enemy. As Alexander was unable to conquer the lands of Kaidefa, he went on a journey alone and set foot on the lands of Kaidefa and entered the court of Mother Kaidefa. The repetitions are his, not mine. Um, and as he was observing her style and attitude, her decisions and measure, her moves and actions, again, him, not me, um, by the wisdom of God, a soldier of Kaidefa recognized Alexander and after seizing and binding him, brought him in the presence of Kaidefa. Kaidefa had had Alexander's portrait drawn, and when they compared Alexander to that portrait, they knew it was him. Kaidefa gave Alexander no mercy and had him imprisoned, and he stayed captive for quite some time. At last, Kaidefa let him out from prison and made him swear that he would never fight and draw a sword against her, after which she freed him. From there, Alexander went to his capital of Iraq on the foot of Mount Alborz and held counsel with all his wise men. Alexander's ministers said, My lord, what could be the dignity of this woman called Kaidefa that us march with a sea-like army, destroy and ruin her lands and domains, put her people to the sword, and roast their hearts? I like the last little detail. <laughs> uh, uh, to which Alexander replied, When Kaidefa let me out of prison, I promised and swore, and swore not to rise army or sword against her. Find me a cure to this so I can take vengeance from Kaidefa. So there is one of the wise men, Khazuf. Khazuf is some kind of a saintly, uh, um, uh, uh, mythical figure of something between a saint and a wise man and uh, some kind of a magician. And he lifted his head, his head, uh, head and said, Oh, Alexander, if you wish to take revenge from Kaidefa, without even waging war and conflict, or massacre and killing, you should at once open the Black Sea, close to the city of Macedonia, <coughs> and make it flow into the White Sea. White Sea is what the Ottomans call the Mediterranean. All of Kaidefa's lands and possessions shall be flooded by water, and you will have your revenge while keeping to your word. Then all of Alexander's wise men exclaimed, Ah, oh, how wonderful. This is the most beautiful and God-inspired measure. All the wise, most noted and most favored engineers measured the height of the Black Sea and the White Sea, and having found the Black Sea more elevated, they gathered seven times 100,000 mining workers, that's 700,000, um, <laughs> and uh, um, who started cutting the Black Sea while Hizr was watching over the excavation. In short, as the sea like army of workers were cutting the Black Sea and was over, about to open up, upon Hazir's decision, the Muslims were persecuted and their wages cut, while employment was given to the infidels and their salaries were paid in advance. Looks like very un Ottoman, but look, until after three years of this situation, when the work was done and the Black Sea found its way, it drowned all the infidels with their salaries. Uh, whereas not a single man among the Muslims uh, was hurt. And among Kaidefa cities, Macedonia and old Istanbul, which is what the Ottomans call Troy, Troya, and the city of Lirios, go figure, and the city of the citadel of Yoros. And in all, 1,700 cities were flooded, and not a single soul among Kaidefa and her soldiers was saved, as they were all drowned in the water. 
That's the story according to um, uh, Ebiachi. Now, what's interesting is that he has a little, dis he's got a little, two little verses that accompany this description, which says, from certain literature, which in old Turkish means one who shows, I, I tried to make it mine, so yeah. uh, one who shows mercy to his foe when he has plowed will share the fate of Kaidefa without any doubt. I, I tried to, you know. Uh, and uh, that was, for me, the connection to the original text, the original uh, um, story. 14th century, 1390, the end. Ahmedi has an Iskender name, that is a story of Alexander, a book of Alexander, where you have practically exactly the same two verses. That was a connection, it clicked, and I discovered that what Eviangeli was telling, the story he was telling, was Ahmedi's uh, Iskender Name. Ahmedi's Iskender Name is something that is very difficult to read. It's 8,000 distichs, you know, uh, in poetry, um, uh, and uh, part of it is uh, related to uh, Kaidefa. So what I did is um, analyze the story as it was told by Eviachidi and as it was told by Ahmedi. And, you know, with certain variations, it kind of stuck. It's the identical story. Uh, it's a boy meets girl story. The boy being Alexander, the, um, and the woman being Candace, Kandake. Kaidefa, in the Arab, Islamic, Turkish tradition, is no other than Kandake, the, cre the queen of cre the queen of Meroe, the queen of Ethiopia, which has an adventure um, in the Alexander Romans. Now that's something everybody knows about. It's a classic of Western and Eastern uh, uh, Romans. And uh, so when you look at the plot in Ephiatidae, the end of the 17th century, and Ahmedi, the end of the uh, uh, 14th century, with differences in style, it's the same plot. That is, again, Kaidefa is a woman who threatens, challenges, in a sense, by her presence and her kingdom, uh, Alexander. Alexander uh, um, wants to meet her, in fact, asks her to submit, to surrender to his office. She refuses, so he decides not to confront her directly, but goes in uh, disguise. He, uh, he's disguised as, as, a, as a soldier and goes to the court of Kaidefa, of uh, Candace. And uh, there uh, he is discovered because of this famous portrait that Candace had, or Kaidefa, had made, had, had made of him uh, beforehand. So when he's exposed, she imprisons him. And at the end, she releases him on condition that he will not attack her. And he goes, and then comes the story, that is, the revenge of Alexander, who, instead of letting it be, decides that he's going to destroy this woman who uh, shamed him, in a sense, and forced him into uh, submission. Now, there are differences. For example, Ahmedi is not talking about the Hellespont or uh, the, um, the Black Sea or the... He's talking about the Queen of Maghreb. Whatever that means in the minds of the Ottomans is not clear, but it's something located much more west. And he talks about, of course, the Sea of Rum. And for the Ottomans, Rum is Rome. It's the Mediterranean flowing into the lands of the Maghreb. So there are geographical differences, if you want, but by and large, the plot is the same. So the next question is to try to understand how this uh, relates to the Alexander romance, that is, the classic, the one that we know has circulated so much in most of the ancient uh, and medieval uh, world before that. Let's not be surprised by this presence of Alexander in Ottoman uh, lore. Uh, there are plenty of uh, manuscripts that illustrate um, um, what's the name? Uh, Alexander through Iskender Names and derivatives of that, where, of course, he is localized, he's vernacularized. Um, 
he looks like some kind of a typical oriental uh, uh, despot or oriental uh, ruler. You can see him at war, you can see him uh, with the philosophers. Now, the nice thing about the philosophers is that they're identical. It says something about uh, <laughs> academia, I suppose. They're all identical and they are in awe in front of the, um, the, the, um, the sultan. Because he's a sultan, he's not a Greek king or whatever. He is a Muslim and that's why you have even depictions of people mourning him at, upon his death in a very Ottoman Muslim kind of context, that is, in a very typical 16th century kind of casket with the very typical Ottoman custom of placing the turban of the deceased at the head of the casket. So he's completely Islamicized and even more than that, he's Ottomanized in a sense visually, but he's there. He's all over, and Iskander, there are plenty of Iskander Pashas or whatever. If I ask uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the audience here, I'm sure there must be Alexander Sashas and whatever. It's, it's a universal kind of reference, and it is for the Ottomans uh, too. So it's not surprising. But what is surprising is that when you can compare Ahmedis, the first Turkish, and I'm using Turkish in a linguistic sense, I mean, I'm not into uh, uh, any kind of ethnic or, or proto-national uh, definition. He is a Muslim who uses Turkish, Ottoman Turkish, to describe his uh, story, uh, to write his story. When you compare it to a classical, the Ul text, Ul, the, the, the text of the Alexander Romans, um, you see that there are enormous solid, uh, uh, similarities. Again, it's about, you know, look at the old Alexander Romance in its fifth century version. Candace is Queen of Meroe, and she writes to, uh, uh, um, uh, he writes to, to her to uh, uh, kind of uh, trick her into meeting with him. Uh, she rejects his advances, uh, but sends a present, and he sends an artist, uh, she sends an artist to have his portrait made, and then he uh, disguises himself into uh, the role of an ambassador of, um, of Alexander and goes to a court where, uh, thanks to the portrait, he is identified and, uh, and caught. The difference is, however, that uh, in secret, she says, you know, I know who you are, but I let you be. Again, on grounds that you will let me free, you will not attack me. And what is really different between the two versions is that uh, the Alexander romance uh, ends happily. That is, Candace is, uh, leave, uh, lets, uh, what's his name, uh, Alexander uh, leave freely, and Alexander goes. And that's it. And then he moves on to another adventure, that of the Amazons and whatever. So uh, Candace gets away with it. And this is what you call a Victor Victus uh, kind of, uh, of, of plot, that is, the victorious person ends up being uh, uh, won over by his potential victim. But that's it. There's no hard feelings and there's no revenge. Whereas on the Turkish side, on the Ahmadi side, there is this incredible story of Hazir getting this brilliant idea, why don't we flood uh, her, her kingdom and take revenge? So, where does that come from? That's really the question. Now, here it is. So for the next three hours, I'm going to analyze this, uh, <laughs> this diagram. Uh, I can re reassure you, I'm not even sure I know what this is about, because I mean, Richard Stoneman is the specialist uh, with respect to the diffusion and the versions of the Alexander Romance. So I copied it from this book, and this is what it gives. I mean, the red ones are the lost versions. It's a very complex uh, story of transmission. You have the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, lambda versions, and whatever. And of course, you have different ramifications. Some are lost, and some are the ones that will survive and lead to some of the uh, most, the strongest traditions east and west of the story of Alexander. And uh, you can see that it's through Syriac, Pahlavi, Armenian, Arabic, Coptic, and whatever, that you end up uh, having the Latin version which will define the Western 
versions of the Alexander Rome mountains. And then you have the Oriental versions. Nobody knows exactly where they come from, and that's it. And rather typically, uh, most of the scholarship is interested in the Christian, uh, say, and Western diffusion of things. And for the Oriental versions, there is generally a rather simple uh, plot uh, that involves the Iranian versions, the Islamic Ajani and uh, Ferdowsi. This is just an illustration to give you a sense of the variations around the same theme. When you look at the names in Greek, Syriac, Ethiopic, Persian, uh, and Turkish, you can see that some names disappear because they're not even mentioned, but some names uh, find their way to be transformed from uh, Kandavis into Kandaros, Kandaros, Kaidush, Kandaros. Kandaros. Yeah, this is, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, but it's a complex beauty, and I'm not into that. What I'm interested in is to try to understand this mystery of why this Ottoman, proto-Ottoman, early Ottoman author in 1390 comes up with a totally different ending. What is it? I mean, is it just misogyny? Is it, what is it that makes him uh, completely transform that particular story into one where Alexander wins, and wins in a very destructive, very aggressive way. So, obviously, you would look for what is closest to the Ottoman tradition, meaning the Iranian, the Eastern traditions. And when you look at those traditions, you realize that that story is nowhere to be seen. And in fact, the uh, Nizami Ganjali story is one that is very similar to the Alexander Romance, the classical one, with no uh, problems really arising between Candace, uh, who's called Mushaba uh, by, uh, by Ganjali, and, um, and Alexander. In fact, there's a lot of feasting and love. And in uh, the Alexander Romance, uh, it's only in the Ethiopic version that you have them making love. Uh, now, considering that she's the queen of Ethiopia, I suppose they knew better. But, you know, that's otherwise, it's, a, it's kind of a smooth uh, uh, story. Um, if you look at the other uh, author, um, oops, sorry, uh, the other author, Ferdowsi, who is considered to be, you know, through his shop now, uh, the book of the shop of the emperor, which is uh, Iskandar Nameh. Uh, you look at this uh, plot, it's very similar to the Alexander Romance. There still is no drama. There is some tension, there is, again, the rec video recognizing the, uh, but there is no terrible, dramatic, tragic, aggressive, uh, destructive uh, end to the story. So, once again, Ahmedi seems to stand out as being different from all the other uh, uh, versions. How can we uh, explain that? By pressing the wrong button again. That's when I came across yet another uh, Eastern version, that of Hosro Dahlavi. Dahlavi means from Delhi. So he is, of course, of the Iranian tradition, but from Delhi, from, uh, from India. And interestingly, he has a flood story, but it's not related to <coughs> Candace. It's not related to, Alexa uh, to, to Candace, to Kaidefa. It's related to uh, uh, Alexander, but there are very strong similarities. Alexander, a Muslim, I mean, this is very typical of the Arab and Persian tradition. He's a good Muslim, and this shows you to what extent he's a good Muslim, because he's proselytizing um, his faith by force of example and sword, feeling secure by virtue of the impassable mountains of the country. The Greeks, then again, rebuffed this envoy, this envoy and incurred Alexander's wrath. When his army was stalled in the mountains of Greece, he took up a stratagem proposed by Thiri. There we have him, the saintly figure, the magician, the wise man who comes up with this very brilliant idea, let's destroy them by the sea. 
to cut a channel from the sea to the great stronghold, unleashing the fury of the sea. He ordered his men to cut through three leagues of rock. Sounds very familiar. Uh, the soldiers completed the channel in three months and built a fire against the final obstacle, melting, in a sense, the end of that obstacle. As the stone crumbled, the waters surged forward and engulfed the Greeks in a great wave of death. Among the few men, to escape the flood was Plato, uh, who devoted himself to God, our God, of course, and soon became Alexander's uh, spiritual advisor. I like the irony of Alexander destroying the Greeks, uh, you know, coming from the East and destroying the Greeks, uh, who were arrogant enough to think that the mountains were going to stop it. And of course, the idea of Plato converting to Islam and becoming a spiritual advisor, uh, yeah, it's interesting, but it's not exceptional. Again, it is part of this Islamization of the whole notion of Alexander, his greatness, his role as a philosopher king, but also as a major uh, um, actor in the propagation of uh, the faith. And there is one very nice um, uh, representation of, uh, of this flood uh, at the Walters Art Museum in one uh, volume of um, Dahlavi's uh, Khamsa. Khamsa is five, it's a quintet, and in this quintet he has five stories, one of which is the Aineni Skandar, that is the mirror of Alexander. And that's where you see this representation, um, you can read it, I mean it's a very telling 16th century uh, image, if I can find it. The pointer, um, but then again, you know, uh, I can throw the pointer. <laughs> yes, that's that's how you know that I'm not an art historian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So you can see there the guys who have uh, uh, destroyed the obstacle, uh, uh, and uh, here are the results of uh, that flood. So there I have it, I have a connection to one Eastern story, and this is uh, a 12th century, uh, a 13th century uh, text, so it's uh, a century and a half earlier than uh, Ahmedi, which seems to provide not exactly the plot, but at least the inspiration for a different ending to Alexander and Candace's uh, story. Instead of you know, using the Greeks, all you have to do is put Candace, Kaidefa, in their place, and it works fine because, as you can see, that's how uh, Ekiyachi, maybe some centuries later, will come up with the idea that Kaidefa was the key queen, not of Ethiopia, not of the Maghreb, but of the Greeks from Macedonia to Smyrna. Okay, now I have two things, yeah. So, obviously, this is something that goes hand in hand with a very Western tradition, a universal tradition of flooding. I don't have to uh, tell you anything about it, but all of these representations, it's interesting to see how the representation of the, the flood by an Italian artist or by an Indian artist in the 16th or 17th century is pretty much identical. It's about people surviving by clinging to mountains and, and whatever. So this is the original, that's a simpler uh, kind of uh, thing than Stoneman's, uh, this is the original uh, uh, plot we had for um, uh, the, uh, the Ottoman uh, uh, Iskandar Name, and this is not Turkish, in the sense that uh, Turkish scholars of Ottoman literature and whatever don't even make the connection between Ahmeti and the Alexander Romans. That's why a 19th century uh, uh, historian can come up with something new. Uh, I'm, I'm really competing against a very, very, very low level of erudition and scholarly um, uh, 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 performance. So, the Shahname and the Iskandar Name, Nizami Dajeli and Ferdowsi, uh, lead to, uh, to Iskandar Name. Obviously, there are similarities because it's the same language, Persian, a lot of Persian in the. Uh, but I have this problem, and I haven't gone into the detail of the other stories in the Iskandar Nameh, but at least for Candace, it doesn't work. You have to have something else. And this something else is the Aina Aina Iskandari, uh, the, uh, the one I mentioned, by Amir Khosrow Dahlavi, 
one century before, which is connected to the Dalab Nama by Abu Tahir al Tarsusi, but then again, I'm not a specialist, so take whomever's word for it, but it's a complex kind of interaction between several uh, texts. But there's more. There's more because there is another Persian text of the 12th century, early 12th century, called the Mojmal al Tabarikh, which means basically the compilation of histories, which has a passage concerning a Greek flood, where he says, I have heard that there was a famous philosopher in the land of Greece, Plato, or another whose name I have forgotten, <laughs> uh, who knew that a flood would occur that the islands would be drowned in water, and that he knew the time this would take place from astronomy. So he wrote in a book that in such and such year, he wished to be buried on top of an island. In short, the plot goes, as most people do not heed his advice, and end up drowning in the flood, whereas the few who did are saved because they have gathered on the summit of that island where he was buried. So there you have one additional link. It's not a, an Eastern, but a Western, or Greek link, that of the Greek cataclysmos, the Greek legends of the flood, which is, and you have uh, quite a number of floods, uh, depending on, on, on your authors. You have the Ogaius uh, flood, uh, flood of the uh, Attica, you have the Deucalion, the Deucalion, you have the Dardanus, Dardanus, Dardanelles. So you have floods. Who doesn't have floods in their, uh, in their history? So it's one link through the Motrana Tarari that brings you to the Aina Iskandari. So <coughs> more. The more is in Herodotus. There's a passage in Herodotus that I will not read it, it's just for show. It's a passage in the seventh book, I think, where he talks about the opening of a channel by Tsetis in the Halkidiki, that famous peninsula, the third or first coming from the east uh, finger of the, um, or leg, uh, as the Greeks say, of the Halkidiki, which is Mount Athos. And there you have the story by Herodotus, who was almost contemporary of the uh, Peloponnesian Wars, uh, the Persian Wars, who tells you the story of this piercing of the Texas Canal, here. And, you know, there are plenty of 19th century sources that try to reconstitute this historical moment when the, uh, the Persian king uh, um, transfers, in a sense, uh, the um, uh, Mount Athos, uh, the peninsula. And, you know, if you don't believe me, you should believe uh, the Greek government. Uh, of historical importance, Canal of Texas, 480 BC. So this is, uh, that's the beauty of Google, you know, you can find reconstitutions of the canal from aerial uh, photography. So there you have one more, one more source of inspiration, which is not just about the flooding, but it is about piercing the mountains in order to have the water flow. And there you have it. And this is something that is documented through Herodotus, Thucydides, uh, uh, Diodorus, and Strabo. Uh, Strabo. It's, it's, it's a classic, if you want. How did the author of Motrana Tavari or uh, Dahavi get a hold of that information? We don't know. And I, I don't really care, in a sense, because my issue is with the Ottoman um, uh, stories. It's about the archaeology of the text and trying to relate it to an alternative uh, story. Now, to finish, I would like to look at the afterlife of Ahmedi's story, because, again, what is it that links Ahmedi to Eviatri um, in the 17th century? If I know my Ottomans, it wouldn't be really the written text. Even if there is a distant, it is most probably from a moral tradition. And this is confirmed by the fact that Rico, who probably did not read Ahmedi, has the same information and narrates it as a local tradition 
of the people of the region who explain the formation of the genesis, if you want, of the Aegean Sea by uh, this story of uh, Kaidefa. Anyway, we do have quite a number of Alexander's stories, Iskandar Names or Sipi Iskandari or whatever, uh, that from the 14th century to the 16th century may provide some kind of a link. Again, I still believe that the oral tradition is stronger, but, and I haven't uh, uh, gone through all these sources, not to mention the fact that some of them are lost. We know of them only through uh, prosopography and from uh, biographical dictionaries. But there is some writing, and therefore you can imagine the transmission of Ahmedi's revised version uh, through the ages, both through some texts, but especially through uh, narration, oral narration, because it's a good story. That's what makes it, the Alexander romance is an excellent story. That's what makes it such a universal uh, romance. But the Ottomans gave it a twist, which is, I don't know, misogynist? I mean, what is it that uh, forces Ahmedi to, to uh, change the ending into something that works against um, 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 Kadefa? Is it just misogyny, or is it the fact that he wants Alexander to win? Because Alexander has become this almost sacralized image of a king and of a Muslim, so you don't want him to return to his camp with his tail between the, uh, uh, his legs. You want him to win, and you want a divine intervention, so you bring it uh, listen. I don't have an answer, but this is just one example of something, uh, 1035, that's the 17th century. Uh, it's Melizade Atai, a great author of the 17th century, who says, It's not about Alexander, it's about just, you know, that uh, uh, episode. He destroyed the lands of Kadefa, pouring water over the fire of treason. So it's really taken as a moral story that is uh, the rightful attack of a king over somebody who challenged his uh, authority. Just for the beauty of the images, plenty of illustrated manuscript, illustrated copies of the Ahmedi uh, Iskander Name. There are about a hundred, um, not all illustrated, uh, in, in Turkish uh, and other libraries. Uh, interestingly, they have an obsession with one story. This is an exception. Alexander meets Candace, not very interesting, but most of them represent that story that seems to be the most interesting plot, the fact that she recognizes him through the portrait. So there you can see them sitting and she shows him his portrait, like, aha, that's you, I got you. So a repetition, again, it's Alexander being shown his own portrait by Candace. Again, Candace showing Alexander his portrait. Again, Candace showing, you know, it's all over the place. So the public must have liked that uh, kind of twist uh, very much because it's, uh, it's, it's a nice story, obviously. But what is interesting is that this continuity is sometimes challenged by contradiction. And one contradiction, and I'll end with that, is a fascinating, very heavily illustrated manuscript of the Alexander Romance that comes from Trebizond, from Trapezond to Trapezond, uh, 14th century, and that is now preserved at the, um, in the uh, Hellenic Institute of Venice. It's a beautiful medieval manuscript with hundreds of illustrations. It's like a comic book. So there are like uh, 20 or more images just relating to the story of Alexander and Candace. One of these is, again, the one where you see the, uh, the artist kind of hidden behind Alexander, drawing his portrait, and then bringing it to Candace. Candace, who is represented as some kind of a Byzantine empress. Uh, this is 14th century. What's interesting is that the others look pretty much like Turks, Ottomans, or whatever, you know, those, uh, uh, but what is interesting, and it's only one image, it's the first image of the series of uh, illustrations of Candace's uh, story, which is 
particularly interesting because what is interesting here is that this document is in Greek, but it was apparently acquired by the Ottoman court, probably after 1461, the conquest of Trebizond by Mehmed II. And it is therefore translated into Turkish. So on each page, you have a very typically crude, simple uh, uh, Turkish of the, of the 15th century uh, that tells you what this image is. It constantly says, in this image, you see, you know, it's, it's an explanation. But what I find particularly interesting is that the first image that mentions Kandake, that mentions Candace, does not call her Kaidefa. In fact, what they say is, in this image, His Majesty Alexander hears that a woman named Kandakis. They are transposing from the Greek pronunciation, and uh, His Majesty Alexander being vexed that in, in his time a woman should be emperor, His Majesty Alexander writes and sends to his woman, to this woman emperor, a letter saying, give me your lands and submit to you, or else I shall drag you on the face of this earth. Very violent, and Having read the, the Greek text, is it as violent? But what's surprising to me is that for a culture which has since the end of the 14th century a Kaidefa story, in 1461, when somebody translates from the Greek, they don't call her Kaidefa, but Kandakis. And therefore, it means that the tradition of Kaidefa was not that dominant to really impose itself into the text of a Turkish translation of this. And throughout the text, Kandakis is abandoned. It's only the first image. She's called Avret Padisha. Avret in Turkish, Avrat Avret, is woman. Padisha is emperor. So throughout the text, she is constantly the woman emperor. Woman emperor, and he is his majesty uh, Alexander. And that, I think, gives us already some kind of a sense of this tension between the legitimate uh, emperor uh, and this illegitimate uh, uh, queen, uh, a woman who is an uh, oxymoron, if you want, who is a, uh, a, a padisha, an emperor, and who therefore has to be uh, destroyed. But since this is a Greek version of the Alexander romance, there is no flood at the end. It is normal in its treatment of the story. So I don't have an answer, but at least I know now that the Ottoman version of the Alexander Romance has been radically transformed, at least for the story of Candace, in 1319, on the basis of a very selective picking of one other story of Alexander and its adaptation to a situation that allowed the author to dominate, in a sense, I'm insisting on the misogyny, dominate a woman uh, in a conflict and challenging Alexander and thus turning around what was the normal uh, plot of the Alexander romance. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Oh yeah. Then 
uh, why uh, why Kandaki in the uh, Kandaki is in the uh, Ottoman translation of uh, the Turkish translation of uh, from Greek? Uh, probably, I mean, if it is a translation of the Greek text, it probably is very close to the Greek original, and probably that's why. Uh, it, the one who translated it might have been a Greek who didn't particularly knew about the... Or just was very faithful to the text he translated and stayed close to that. That's, that's <laughs> the beauty of medieval texts. Anything goes. Um, <laughs> it, no, it's true. I mean, it's very difficult to... And reading the Greek text might solve the mystery, I guess, in this case. Yes. yes. Uh, it may. May. I'm not sure it will. Uh, hope not. Uh, but uh, yes, I mean, first of all, what you say about Plato is true, and uh, you remember that when I, I uh, gave uh, the Montreal of the uh, uh, version of the Great Flood, uh, it is associated with Plato, who knows it's coming and wants to be buried on top of an island, uh, some of or whatever, you know, there, it's you know, obvious, but you don't have that in Ahmedi. Right? So I think Ahmedi is kind of taking, cherry picking, and taking out of context things that just hmm, sound good. He's, uh, he's creating. I mean, so I, I think there's not really a literary thing behind what well, literary there is, because he knows about Ferdowsi, about Nizam Gajari, he knows about apparently Gajari, but uh, he doesn't know about Plato. I mean, uh, the, the, the Ottomans used uh, Aristotle and Plato as some kind of a generic uh, um, uh, um, description of, of wisdom. You know, so every sultan is described as uh, as as uh, wise as as uh, Plato or as Aristotle or as both or whatever. You know, um, and when you look at these Gendarmes, there is Aristotle in the story. So, uh, the mentor, if you want, uh, behind, um, what's his name, uh, Alexander, is generally uh, uh, um, Aristotle, not, not Plato. So, Plato comes in only in this flood story, in, um, in the Montreal Tavari, and in um, the other one, the Dehedi. Uh, our guy takes the flood, not Plato. He takes the flood. And he takes the flood and transposes it in another context, uh, that of the revenge against Kandaki. But again, I think everything is possible, and I don't have the expertise, the competences to go through all the, nor the patience, to go through all these uh, texts. Uh, let the philologists do that, you know. Uh, but my point is just to bring attention to the fact that transmissions are complicated, and we know that from Stoneman, but we didn't know it for uh, Ahmedi. Ahmedi would say, you know, uh, Alexander Romance. For whatever reason, I was lucky enough to uh, come across one situation where there was Kaidefa, otherwise, you know, and, and that's it. Um, now, your other uh, uh, question, or your other comment, yeah, you could say that the translator was Greek, it's possible, it's even probable, uh, and that he knew to translate Alexand Alexandros into Iskander, but not Kandakis into uh, Kaidefa. It's possible, but I, I have no answer to that. Uh, but then again, it's uh, basically that the assumption that a text has a linear kind of uh, genealogy doesn't really convince me. So I think there are people who, who kept to the Kadefa thing, and with all sorts of var variations, she becomes queen of, uh, you know, Margaret. And, and there are those who didn't know about that story, even in the palace, because the assumption is that this ended in the, uh, in the palace, uh, uh, and that they went for Kandakis, and then went for something more descriptive, the woman, uh, not queen, but the woman emperor, uh, which is, you know, a way of, of showing something that they consider to be contra natura, uh, I suppose. But again, I have no real answer. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh,
this extremely interesting, very informative um, uh, presentation, which um, certainly strikes a very interesting chord in uh, Romanian culture, uh, directly or indirectly, because in fact, Alexander narratives circulating in another version is usually coming from the Serbo Croatian. So it's the Slavonic rather than the Greek, and the question is why is it more from the Greek? Because all the classics of Romanian culture were Greekized or taught in Greek. I mean, if you took a, a stroll down uh, the university uh, square, facing the university, you see the statues of the classics, the canonicals of Romanian culture, they were all school, or almost everybody was school in Greek rather than any other language. But having said that, and correlating with romantic times, which is what I'm trying to drive the question to, uh, is uh, the idea that this is a watershed for us Romanians, because this is when you stop reading stuff about Alexander and you move into Voltaire, you move into Rousseau, this kind of uh, crazy thing, which is one very interesting uh, point to, to make of the whole thing. But I would just like to correlate what you were saying about the huge head to which you place text and show how the head reads into the text and the text reads into the head. So if you go into the British Museum and go to your right to so what is known as the King's Rooms, and this is George III that uh, lost America. Yeah? Um, I see what it's at. Um, what you get at the entrance is a huge, a huge foot in Roman sandals. We're talking about just tricks, you know. And this is most likely, and I was in the similar situation as you found yourself, trying to pair text to something which is an object. Most likely what the romantic poet Shelley saw when he wrote Ozymandias, which is the Greekization of, of, the, of the pharaoh. Uh, and I would like to correlate this to the idea that what happens in romantic times, like for instance, Coleridge, I mean, English studies, which is why I'm interested in that. Uh, Coleridge looks at the Orient, which is kind of total and composite. Yeah. Forgive us our ignorance of, of the Orient. And comes up with a thing called Kubla Khan, so the poem to the Khan Kublai. And you have exactly the same kind of, this is what I was trying to say, archetypes. You have the valiant male, you have the female, who is the empress? She is Abyssinian, the Abyssinian maid. You mentioned Ethiopia. And you have exactly the same kind of conflict. So it's most likely, as you are saying, there must be a wound text. There must be one. That it's much too human to human. So that doesn't really lead into ethnic differences. So that was a kind of, you know, a footnote of your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a footnote. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, uh, 
Ahmed is also the first, as far as I remember, uh, uh, illustrated manuscripts, for, uh, like three years after the, after the, of the author we have uh, it. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, to what extent do, do you think that maybe uh, there is an interplay between uh, uh, visu visual uh, depictions and the arrangement of, of the text? I mean, uh, and because Manuscripts very often uh, in this period they are uh, used for loud reading, for actually more like uh, kind of, as you said, comics that someone is reading aloud. And uh, uh, I wanted to ask you to what extent maybe it's not the, uh, the textual influence, but rather the visual influence that may play the role in this strange arrangement. I'd like to believe that, but I can't really, because I think we have a tendency to blow up the importance of a few illustrated manuscripts, uh, which were safely tucked as precious objects in certain collections. So the idea that, you know, uh, in, a, in a coffee shop, in whatever, people would be, oh, look, this is Alexander showing me. I don't think that existed. It may have developed in the 18th and 19th century. You have chapbooks uh, in, in later times where you have stories of Alexander and whatever, all sorts of stories. And this is something that need to be, needs to be explored. I mean, to see if the flood version uh, finds its way into some of the, the chapbooks of the 18th and 19th centuries. I, I haven't done that. Again, it's not my business. I mean, I found this and I can move on to something else uh, now. Um, but uh, I don't think so. Now, obviously, there is this, uh, oh, I was going to say obsession, you know, this desire to show that the audience <laughs> had uh, illustrations and whatever, that they were not that different from. I'm not really convinced, and I think it's okay. I mean, you don't have to constantly try to put them uh, on equal footing with the uh, with the Europeans, the Renaissance, and whatever. All this obsession with Mehmed the Second being a uh, prince of the Renaissance, yeah, sure, but it's it's not the same, and it's okay that it should not be the same. Uh, so no, and and I, I don't think so, and. As far as I know, the earliest manuscripts of the uh, Iskandar Name are not illustrated. The one, the only one that was critically edited, Edition Critique, you know, and that's what I love about Ottoman, uh, well, Turkish Edition Critique, they're critical about the philology, but not about the context. So you have uh, all the listing of, oh yes, the ending of this word in manuscript nya, 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 is whatever, and nobody, and, and, and the edition critic doesn't even talk about the Alexander romance. So, you know, I mean, it's, uh, but the early ones, as far as I know, they're not illustrated. Uh, Ottoman illustrations start in the 16th century, and I think under the influence of artists who come from Iran, from India, uh, and uh, you know, so it's an acquired taste, uh, but at a later uh, time. So I don't know. Uh, obviously, there are four or five images, and the fact that it's always the same image makes you think that yes, maybe there is some kind of a best-selling image, the image that really sticks about Candace. And, but you know, I, I, it's it's very difficult to work. Um, to make generalizations on the basis of unique, almost unique documents. That's what art historians do. I don't share that, uh, that enthusiasm and that optimism. I'm, I'm kidding, you know. But, uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, uh, not really, but hey. Yeah, thank you, Evan, for wonderful and highly entertaining lecture. Um, and you, you gave us a wonderful example of what could be an underlying principle called um, variation, uh, repetition with variation. This is what this type of story, how this type of storytelling works. And in your case, you asked the um, two questions to the specific variation that you presented. Why did he do it and where did he get it? And uh, you did a wonderful job in the where did he get it. Now for the why did he do it, you offer the misogyny. <coughs> might be an additional explanation. It's striking that it relates to the landscape. 
and many of these tales relate to a specific explanation of how a particular item in the landscape came about. It has the advantage that later on you can travel there and can you see, oh, this is where this story happens and this is why this part of the earth looks like it looks. And um, I wonder whether in, in the epos in general there are more stories like this that relate to the landscape in an explanatory fashion because then it would be for me plausible why he did this collection. Yes, uh, this is something that I think explains Iliadji, 17th century. The guy is and the guy is only narrating what seems to be a local tradition. And local means he's a traveler, he's gone to Izmir, so obviously he's telling a, a, a Smyrna story, uh, and Smyrna kind of looks at the archipelago. So, yes, and he go, tells the same uh, story, which again confirms, and this is, I think, one of the most beautiful uh, coincidences I, I was happy to find, an Ottoman and a Western uh, source uh, telling the same thing. So, yes, I think if Yajinibi's version, which is probably a local version, is a localized version in the sense that it talks about the environment of that area. But that still doesn't explain uh, Ahmedi, because Ahmedi at the end of the 14th century is talking about the Queen of Maghreb and talking about something that looks more like uh, Gibraltar than uh, the Aegean. He's not talking about the Aegean. So that's yet another dimension which I haven't uh, mentioned. But yes, the text in its transition from the 14th century to the 17th century acquires more of a local character, a local cachet, which is based on exactly what you say, which is explaining the topography, the environment, and whatever. So it's localized. Perhaps there are versions uh, in other regions of the that explain. I don't know. And of course, what I didn't talk about is uh, the theories uh, about which I understand nothing about the creation of the uh, the, the, the Black Sea, or because there are theories about. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about contemporary uh, theories about the great cataclysm of the um, of the filling of the Black Sea. It's a reverse uh, story for whatever reason from the Aegean into the but. Whatever. But yes, in that case, yes, there's another dimension I haven't uh, even mentioned because I'm incapable of, of bringing anything to it. It's the question of what about other contemporary traditions of the 17th century, Greek, Armenian, uh, whatever, because I mean, Anatolia is multilingual. So what you get from Pediagene is Turkish, but is it Turkish from a local Greek tradition? Or is it Turkish from the local Turkish? Or Turkish in the linguistic sense of the word? That's very complicated. And because most of the Greek scholars have a tendency to look at whatever uh, happens after 1453 as post-Byzantine, uh, it, it makes it difficult to really uh, get a sense because I'm, I'm pretty sure that the Greeks of Anatolia had their story of Alexander. And I'm pretty sure the Armenians have too, because ever since the 5th century, they have a romance of uh, an Alexandrian romance. So everybody and his uncle had a different version of it, I suppose, but I'm sure that they interacted. And I'm sure that what ended up uh, being told, again, narrated and, and verbally transmitted, was a combination, a constant interaction between these stories. And that's why I love the 19th century. Uh, uh, it's um, it's so much easier. You can go to the archives. Everything is you know written down. You have a state that that takes a record of everything. There are newspapers. You know it's it's. Um, I'm kidding, but I mean this is uh, and it's so difficult to talk about uh, such verbal, oral, uh, local folk traditions. It's it's very daunting, especially in an environment that is so multilingual so diverse, religiously, ethnically, whatever the, uh, it's, uh, so yeah, there's no end to it. There are still three questions, and I suggest that we should maybe stop after these three questions. But well, the problem is not with the questions. I was just to quote because we just asked the wise, oh, sorry.
Oh, oh sorry, sorry. 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 Um, yeah, so my question is actually quite similar to the one that was asked before. So we have the explanation of the misogyny, we have the explanation of sort of, of explaining local phenomena, but obviously it's usually sort of history that shapes the stories that are told. So I was just wondering if there was any historical context that might explain this, this sort of turn of the story, like maybe a crisis, a war, a revival of the Alexander story or something like, obviously as a historian, I guess you're a good person to answer this question. You're, you're right. I mean, well, first of all, the misogyny, I, I'm, it's not just misogyny, it's imperial misogyny, it's political <laughs> misogyny. It's the idea that, you know, uh, a woman ruler is unacceptable. It's, it's would you call it more sophisticated misogyny? But, you know, uh, so misogyny is a, a little bit of cheap shot or a very basic kind of thing. You know, yeah, uh, early modern culture is misogynist. And, you know. um, now, what you say about political crises, uh, yes, I, I suppose it's a possibility, um, especially if you consider that Ahmedi's Iskandar Name is a mix of the story of Alexander with the story of the Ottoman dynasty. Yet I can not connect, I, I cannot see exactly, especially since it was written in 1390, now there's several versions, and there is a major uh, crisis in 1402, uh, when uh, the, the Mongols uh, uh, kind of, you know, destroy the Ottomans. Uh, and, and so you can imagine all sorts of contexts that need to be uh, envisaged as a positive. Most people who've worked on the Ahmedi have concentrated on that, but not with a vision of how this may impact the Iskandar part of it, um, but with just the idea that there is Ottoman history uh, in that, and look, it's, you know, fine, I, I think it's a possibility, but then again, it's a far stretch, you know, oh, the Ottomans are having a hard time, let's find a flood, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm being too mechanistic, but but yeah, I think that needs to be uh, explored by people who know how to explore those things, uh, not a 19th century uh, historian. Yes. Thank you very much for your lecture. My question concerns Hezer, the author of the Maritime Revenge Solution. Um, is there any relationship between him and the Hezer, uh, the, the very high spiritual character in Sufism, there is the real man who is above all religious traditions, and if I'm not wrong, he is situated in the point of the contact of the two seas, the two oceans, the worldly ocean and the celestial one. Is there some relationship between this magical, uh, uh, very funny character of his in? in this story and the Sufis uh, condition of al Hidr, like Solomon who is a magician and on the other side a very high person. Okay, I'm not sure I can answer that question because I haven't looked into the career of uh, uh, but he is a major kind of uh, a joker, a uh, joker in the card game sense. Uh, he comes in whenever you are squeezed in a untenable situation, he's the one who finds a solution. And he's also this strange link between Islam and pre-Islamic or non-Islamic traditions, because he is sometimes St. George. Hudr uh, el is St. George's uh, feast and whatever. So he's, he's really very much part of a not very orthodox a version of Islam, a popular one, which likes to have a magician and which likes to inte integrate other religions and their lore into the... Now, uh, about the two oceans and... Uh, I, I don't know, but I mean, this looks pretty much like uh, the Ottomans wanting to Islamicize, in a magical way, the story. It's like, you know, the tradition of the... Uh, uh, of uh, the Hagia Sophia, where uh, the, the story goes that it's again Hazur who tells Solomon, because of course it's Solomon building the Hagia Sophia, that because it keeps crumbling down, he says you should take the spit of the Prophet Muhammad and that will cement the thing. So uh, 
it's a beautiful anachronism, but it works fine, and it integrates Islam into a pre-Islamic building and turns it into a, a, a mosque. And the third is again the intermediary. He's the wise guy, he's the wise man who finds the perfect solution. There's something demonic almost uh, in, in him, in the sense that he is playing with fate and with whatever. But again, uh, yeah, uh, one would need to uh, look into uh, the whole story of Hazir to see how. But it's interesting that Hazir is already there uh, in Dahavi's story. So it's not really Ahmadi inventing. Uh, he is importing the flood with Hazir into his story. But, yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, very informative and also entertaining uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to make a comment about the evolution of the story. Indeed, transmission through centuries tends to add local color for the people to relate to, for the people who just feel that way as well. But the opposite theory works as well. You may see the themes, the subjects, and the motives coagulating around archetypal type of situations. I see two elements in this one. One is uh, surprising to me an obsession with uh, portrait. The portrait is a key element, and I want to refer, maybe, excuse me if that's a trivial reference to Ram Kamuk, the whole story of the miniature painters in Istanbul and uh, doing a portrait of the Sultan and so forth. Extremely sensitive topic and very strongly related ideologically, religiously, and so forth. So the portrait is one constant, if you want, an archetype of things. And of course, flood is a traditional punishing in many contexts and religions. So if somebody wants to bring by a revenge, flood is one of the archetypal possibilities to do so. So you see also coagulation, signification towards permanent archetypes and themes. Yes. What, what I find interesting in the flood story here is that it is um, combination of what you may call divine wrath, or at least imperial wrath, and technological feat, right. the Texas thing. So it's not just because, I mean, the floods, the divine floods are, they come out of nowhere, you don't know, there's no explanation that God is uh, uh, digging through the, it's like, blah, it's on your face, and, and that's it, and you die, or you survive, or you, uh, whereas here it's a combination of that with um, a human intervention, that of digging a canal through the, and, and he takes both. Uh, so it's, that's uh, very interesting. But the imagery, again, it's a very problematic issue for the reason that European scholarship has been so obsessed, especially in the 19th century, with the idea of, oh, do the Muslims have images or don't they? That the Muslims now, or uh, what cars are, are now constantly thinking in terms of, oh, we had images. You know, you go to the museum in Doha, uh, and the, the first thing is about animal and human representations in Islam, as if it was, you know, because they have to prove that, oh, yeah, we had it. And the second exhibition is the astrolabe, we had science too. You know, it's constantly, that's, you know, Orientalism and whatever, provoking. And, so, therefore, the idea that, oh, the portrait is so present, and yet these are people who do not use uh, portraiture, uh, it's problematic. And yet I am the one who said that I don't think that the miniature albums were very common. And so I don't have an answer, but it's, it's very problematic. The, the, again, generalization from, uh, we have to dig more into the documentation to really try to make sense of something that might be considered to be some kind of a pattern. I'm, 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 I started with economic history, I started with, you know, and I still believe in theories, in things that you can quantify to a certain extent in order to make a point. Um, so, but then again, you have to try and, uh, and propose something as an explanation. So, yeah, but five illustrations, four of which are about the portrait. And yet, in the Greek version, there are like 30 images. There's the image of the guy making the portrait and of the painter bringing it to Candace, but there's no representation of Candace exposing uh, um, uh, Alexander through the portrait. So go figure. How would you miss on that? Because I mean, that's really 
the, the fun part, like, uh, you know, and Alexander, uh, it's, and how would you miss on that? Because that's really, if you think in terms of people explaining these images, turning the text into some kind of suspense story, that's ideal. But, so, I don't know. <laughs>